It's my pleasure and honor to be here with Dr. Sarah Bunin Benor, who is the Associate Professor of Contemporary Jewish Studies at Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion, and Adjunct Associate Professor of Linguistics at the University of Southern California. Um, I had the pleasure of getting to know her at, uh, through the Wexner Graduate Fellowship. And one aspect of her work, which I find very interesting, is um, researching Jews on their journey into orthodoxy. And has a wonderful book called Becoming Frum that I thought I could speak about. Frum means, uh, actually, maybe you'll tell us what Frum means. Um, so my first question is for you, for you is, when Jews become Orthodox, what is it that, that they change about their language? Well, when Jews become Orthodox, they encounter a whole new way of speaking English, including many Yiddish words like Frum, which means religious, and many Hebrew words, and Yiddish grammatical constructions like staying by them, or what do we learn out from this, or I want that you should see this those kinds of influences from Yiddish in the grammatical structure. They also encounter distinctive intonation. If you've heard it, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and more subtly, if you've heard it, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And uh, they encounter a hesitation click um, like this. We were walking around and it doesn't matter. That click comes from Israeli Hebrew and has become common among American Orthodox Jews. So they encounter all of these distinctive features of language, and they need to decide to what extent they're going to pick up this way of speaking. But sometimes it's not so conscious. Sometimes they pick up some of the features unintentionally. Sometimes they intentionally avoid certain features because they feel that they're bad grammar or that they're not authentic to who they are. Um, they also encounter a continuum of religiosity from modern orthodox to black hat orthodox. And um, by black hat, I mean ultra-Orthodox, as some people say, or Haredi, or, um, and as they're becoming from, they might encounter just one community, or they might encounter multiple communities, and figure out where they themselves want to situate themselves along that continuum. And part of that decision has to do with language, because they'll decide how they want to pronounce Hebrew. Do they want to say, Gemar Chatima Tova? or Gemar Chasima Tova, or Gemar Chasima Toive, right? And so each of those represents a different place along that continuum. The more Israeli-influenced Hebrew is more common in modern Orthodox communities. The Yiddish-influenced or Ashkenazi-Hebrew-influenced Hebrew is um, more on the black hat end of the continuum. And then there are places all along that continuum in the middle. So. I encountered in my research Balei Tshuva, meaning people who become Orthodox, who decided to become from uh, in a modern Orthodox community and then shifted to the right, or vice versa. Most of the people that I encountered distinguished themselves from people to the left and to the right. They say, I am, um, you know, this community is not crazy from like that community, but it's not crazy modern like that. It's not, you know, too modern like that other community. And um, is, is that unique to Bala Tshuva or to the Orthodox community? No, that's an Orthodox right. thing in general. Right. And so people in each community will talk about themselves in relation to right. other people at other places along the continuum. Right, right. Yeah. So what are some of the, you know, as you alluded to, there's a whole spectrum of Orthodoxy of you know, open orthodox, modern orthodox, centrist, mm -hmm. ultra, whatever we want to call that community. Um, and you know, Sephardic is a whole other area. Um, and various Hasidic groups and all this and that. So what are some of the different language uh, choices that individuals will make and, and how different will they end up based upon those communal choices? Right, so the Hebrew pronunciation yeah. is one thing, but then also how many Yiddish grammatical influences uh -huh. is another thing. Right. Um, so saying, staying by them, right. or coming to us for Shabbos, right. that is found throughout Orthodoxy. Yeah. And, and um, I did a survey of American Jews where we got over 40,000 responses, and um, including many Orthodox Jews, yeah. and people across the Orthodox continuum report that they use that phrase, staying by someone. Yeah. Um, and so, but some Balei Tshuva actually avoid that because they feel that it's not proper English. Mm -hmm. um, some embrace it and say, uh, like one woman, for example, said, I don't speak the good Queen's English anymore, or maybe it was the King's English, I forget, <laughs> um, and, and that's fine by me, 
Um, <laughs> and, and she said that she likes the fact that she can um, almost pass as if she grew up Orthodox mm -hmm. because of the way she changed her language. Mm -hmm. So it's really a, a, a major part of it is about social acceptance. Happens with the street cred of using the internal language. Yes, yeah. but some people feel that they can get that street cred without using the language. Uh -huh. They feel that the important thing is about what they believe and how they act rather than their cultural practice. Is that the minority? Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. I think more people intentionally um, assimilate to the Orthodox culture. Right. Now, is, is, is language one of the earliest changes? Is it, or I, I imagine outer appearance. Skirts, kippot, beards, those kind of things. What, what sort of some of the uh, common uh, sequences mm. of changes? Right, it's really different with each person, right. um, but I think the clothing tends tends to come pretty early yeah. because of tznius, modesty, and right. they feel that it's part of their religious observance to dress in a modest way um, and to dress according to the norms of the community. Um, sometimes they'll try on clothing and language, um, and, and yeah, it really does differ, but I think you're right that the clothing does tend to come before the language, um, but kashrut is also an important part of it, and um, taking steps to become more strictly kosher um, is, is common. I would say that probably happens before a lot of the language. Mm -hmm. So if you, were to, if you were to look at the various types of experiences people have in becoming Orthodox, mm -hmm. you know, in the first 10 years and, and even sort of after that, what, what are some of the most common experiences people have? Well, I've identified a few trajectories. Okay. I call one of them deliberate distinctiveness, ah. which is where Balei Tshuva, Jews who become Orthodox, deliberately keep some of their pre-Orthodox um, look or, or practices. Um, for example, um, someone might wear a black hat with trendy sunglasses, uh -huh. uh, which isn't or, so Or common. cool socks yeah. is a popular one, Well, right? now, yeah. Yes. Back, back in 2001 uh -huh. right. when I was doing my research, cool socks weren't a thing right. yet. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, or they'll keep their piercings, uh -huh. right? Um, or um, I have a good example in food where I went to a Shabbat lunch I'm oh, sorry, a Shabbos lunch, and um, the woman who had made the food um, had some unique recipe for her gefilte fish, and someone said, well, this is delicious, what's in it? And she said, curry and turmeric. And I had never heard those words in that community before, uh -huh, right. because these are Indian spices weren't common mm -hmm. back then in, mm -hmm. in 2001. And um, so that kind of thing is deliberately, it's, it's taking on the practices of the community, the black hat, the gefilte fish, um, the the long skirts, the the language of the community, but maintaining some element of who they were before, right? Mm -hmm. Another trajectory is what I call hyper accommodation, where people take on orthodox practices to an extreme. So the, their skirts have to be even longer than those who grew up orthodox, or their um, they'll use the language even more than people mm -hmm. who who grew up that way. Um, and, and so I did find another, a number of examples of people who did that. But then the third trajectory is what I call the bungee effect, where they start off by jumping off the deep end and then they bounce back to a happy medium. Mm -hmm. So they'll, at, at first, maybe um, a man will wear the black hat all the time and wear the white shirt and the black coat, but then he'll just wear the black hat on Shabbos. And mm -hmm. then the rest of the week he'll wear colorful shirts. Mm -hmm. um, or um, a woman will start out by using a lot of these distinctive grammatical features and then realize that it's not really her and kind of temper that. Um, and I, I, found, I found this in a number of people. Um, most of the Bali Chuva that I found fit into one of these categories. Mm -hmm. And um, was it the minority or majority that you found tend to distance themselves from prior relationships? family or old friends mm. people have. Um, and did that come from as an encouragement from teachers or was your sense that that was more of, I need to kind of build a new social community now? Right, I think most of the people did not distance themselves, most of the people that uh -huh. I encountered. Um, but some did and expressed how painful that was wow. or expressed how important it was for mm -hmm. their transition. Um, but the Kiru professionals, the outreach professionals that I encountered, encouraged people to maintain good relationships with their family. Mm -hmm. That was a really important thing in the communities where I was doing my research um, because 
it, it's, it's a commandment to, to honor your mother and father. And, and also, um, it leads to a lot of difficulties. But that was definitely a big issue, you know, how to deal with your family when you change your kashrut level and your parents don't. Can you eat in their home? And how, how do you deal with that, those kinds of So you of mentioned some of the easier or quicker changes, such as language or clothes. And then there's some more difficult changes like relationships. Mm -hmm. what, what else was difficult along that continuum? Those who are in this journey, where do they feel like, I'm not totally accepted yet, mm -hmm. I can't make this change in my life yet? Well, I, I'm, I'm not sure uh, that language is so easy. I think, ah, I think okay. for, for some people that was right. kind of difficult. And even when they learned how to pronounce things, they still felt a little uncomfortable with right, it. You know, right. I met people who had been from for 30 years right. and still felt like they were imposters to some extent. Yeah, a big factor is immersion. I mean, and if you've spent a number of years studying in Israel mm -hmm. or in the yeshiva, you pick up that context. And those who never had that opportunity, yeah, oftentimes if they become from later in life, yeah. I think that it's more difficult to immerse in that way. That's true. I've seen that. Yeah. People who've been going to an Orthodox synagogue for decades who still are, you know, not really tapped into the language bit. Absolutely. How about the, 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 I don't know if it's a new trend or not, but a lot of people who are not observant, mm. but if they're going to go somewhere, they would just go Orthodox. Mm. They almost like look down on Reform, Conservative, mm. it's not authentic, but they, so they only go to an Orthodox place, but in no way do they consider themselves Orthodox. They won't keep kosher, they're not observed mm. Shabbat. Is that a new trend or? No, I don't think so. Yeah. I think it's, it's been a trend and it still is in many countries. Yeah. Um, the, the shul I don't go to is Orthodox or right. the shul I go to for the high holidays. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay, so my last question for you is, what was it like as someone who um, doesn't identify as Orthodox, mm -hmm. uh, doing this research within the Orthodox community? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I would say it was kind of like walking on a tightrope. Uh -huh. A tightrope between access to the community on the one hand and honesty on the other hand. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't, you know, I didn't want to tell them that I had no interest in becoming Orthodox. Right. Um, so when they would ask, are you becoming from, I would say, well, I've been enjoying this new challah recipe that I got from the Revitzin, um, and talking about some things that I've been enjoying yeah. as being immersed in the community. Um, but I, I didn't want to share too much about how much I enjoy my progressive Jewish lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't tell them about the shul that I go to, and I actually felt a little sad that I didn't invite some of my friends from the firm community to my daughter's simchat bat, mm -hmm. her um, you know welcome ceremony, because I felt like they would feel that it was too progressive. And I remember having a conversation with someone about wedding rituals, and they were criticizing the new tradition of the man and the woman sharing the seven circles around each right, other. Right. And I didn't mention that we did that at our wedding. Right, <laughs> so right. so it, was, it was an interesting experience. Um, and I definitely felt a pressure to become from through the process. And I had some instances of being shamed. Um, one was on Purim, when people are not quite themselves, right? Um, and so um, a rabbi talked about how he feels that I should become from. That's the only way, way I'll be able to understand this process is by really doing it myself. Uh -huh. Um, and I said the only thing that I could say, which was, Amen. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what, what, if people want to learn more about this, what research or books should they, should they look at? Well, my book, uh, yes. Becoming From, yeah. How Newcomers Learn the Language and Culture of Orthodox Judaism. Mm -hmm. And I have a website with some resources um, of websites that they can look at and uh, videos that they can watch that have Great. good examples of yeah. from language. What's that website called? Um, just Google becoming from. Become, okay, up, okay, yeah. beautiful. Uh, so look up Professor uh, Sarah Bunin Benor and her wonderful book, Becoming From. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.